Hello, and welcome to the third installment of the speaker series, The Liberal Imaginary and Beyond, which is co-sponsored by the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and the Center on Modernity and Transition. I'm Benjamin Shule, a senior fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics and director of the Center on Modernity and Transition, and I'll be one of your hosts for this speaker series. And I'm Shahrzad Sabet. I'm a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and I'm also your host for this series. The aim of the speaker series is to examine the origins, contents, and development of liberalism after the Second World War, as well as to consider significant attempts to move beyond the resultant social imaginary without casting aside its impressive achievements. A quick note to participants, if you would like to submit questions, there is a Q&A box. So you can submit your, your queries there and we will try to include them into our conversation. We are thrilled to have with us today Kwame Antonia Appia and Shayla Ben Habib, who will be discussing the topic, the future of cosmopolitanism. Um, Kwame Antonia Appia is professor of philosophy and law at New York University and pens the ethicist column for the New York Times Magazine. He is the author of Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, and The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity. Shayla Ben Habib is a professor emerita of political science and philosophy uh, and senior research fellow and professor adjunct of law at Columbia Law School. She recently retired from her former position, and so a warm congratulations are due to you, Shayla. Um, she is the author of Exile, Statelessness, and Migration, and Another Cosmopolitanism. Anthony, Shayla, welcome. Hello, nice to be here. Nice to be with you. So we like to begin each talk on a personal biographical note. Um, in both of your cases, the relationship between your family histories and your philosophical ideas is relatively well known. So to pick up there, I want to begin by asking each of you to perhaps tell us a bit about the experiences and personal histories, the questions and curiosities that led you to think and write about cosmopolitanism. Um, Shayla, perhaps you can begin. Okay, uh, um, th thank you. Um, as I have um, written in uh, several places, um, I was born in Istanbul, Turkey, and uh, my ancestors traced their origins back to uh, Sephardic Jews in uh, Spain. And uh, during my childhood, my uh, family still spoke a version of Ladino, in addition to French, some Italian, uh, Turkish, and of course, uh, subsequently, as uh, the US influence in the Mediterranean replaced the traditional French influence, and France was the lingua franca, English came into our lives. Uh, in my case, I just grew up with um, about four different uh, languages spoken at home uh, with a very distinct sense of the history of Europe and the history of the uh, Mediterranean. And in fact, a long uh, history, which maybe to most Americans is almost inconceivable because it was not unusual to hear relatives uh, and my mom say things like antes 500 años, which in Ladino means before 500 years. And what does exactly <laughs> that mean? And for me, this is important because my work on cosmopolitanism emerges out of also a sense of history and a sense of uh, multiplicity and um uh, one additional experience, probably a very important experience, is that I spent about 15 years uh, on and off studying in Germany. And I was first uh, uh, 27 years old when I went there and uh, to study with Jürgen Habermas. And the uh, experience of being... Um, a Turk in Germany <laughs> and a Jew uh, in all its multiplicities. I see Anthony, <laughs> Anthony laughing. Uh, sharpened my sense of um, both the absurdities <laughs> of uh, nationhood as well as the inevitabilities of you know negotiations or concrete identities. This will take some. 
uh, some time to <laughs> to explain in detail. But as a researcher with a Turkish passport, uh, teaching in an American university, I have had experiences of not being able to cross the border between Germany and France because I have not had, I did not have a proper visa. So I found myself in a European train station on the other side of the border in Baden-Baden mm -hmm. at three o'clock in the morning because I had a Turkish passport. Uh, so uh, experiences like this <laughs> make one make one think about how um, absurd some of the divisions uh, in our um, uh, public lives, in the lives of the nation states are. So I would say that maybe just to summarize, in my case, both my historical multicultural background and the mixture of people's languages and cultures, and also this experience of being sort of the quintessential outsider, you know, in Germany, realizing what it means, you know, to be a Turkish citizen as opposed to a citizen from a more privileged country. And certainly these are impressions and experiences that feed into one's philosophy. Anthony, perhaps you could what? share some of your own experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting. I was raised very explicitly by cosmopolitans. My sisters and I discovered on YouTube the other day an interview with my mother in the early 60s on a British television program, in which she explicitly said, I'm raising my children as citizens of the world. That's what she said, to use that exact expression. And of course, cosmopolites just means citizen of the world. And when my father was dying, he wrote a note to us which said, remember always that you are citizens of the world. So I was raised by people who were who thought that it was sort of necessary to inculcate in their children a strong sense of their world citizenship. So I'd say, you know, for me, that's where it starts. Obviously, you know, my mother was English, my father was Ghanaian. Um, they were actually two people from places that, you know, in the generation before they were born were quite parochial. My mother was born within 20 miles of her 12th century ancestors. And my father, my father's people had oscillated between a village and the town of Kumasi, where we grew up, for two or three hundred years. I mean, they hadn't gone anywhere else. So this was a sudden break with all of that when my father met my mother as a law student in London. And then, you know, um, once the once the connection was made, uh, then, you know, I have a Norwegian brother-in-law or a Nigerian brother-in-law, right? My first brother-in-law was Portuguese, uh, though that didn't last very long. Um, I have a Namibian, Namibian, Namibian great uh, uh, nephew and... Uh, a couple of Nigerian uh, great nephews and nieces, and so on. Uh, I have cousins from India, Kenya, France, United States. Uh, one of my cousins lives in Thailand because he married a Thai. So we are now a you know when we do name we did a naming ceremony because my latest great niece was born on December the thirty first last year, and uh, the, at in the in the Zoom naming ceremony there were people in. Uh, in, uh, on the coast of Namibia, uh, in Lagos, in London, in Oslo, and us here in rural New Jersey. And I've, oh, and in Ghana, uh, which is where I grew up because some cousins were there. So um, it'd be a bit difficult to be, to live narrow nationalism <laughs> if, if, I, if I want to be able to go to family ceremonies. Uh, that would, so I don't, and I, one other thing I should say, and this is, this is something that I think contrasts with Shaya's experience, is um, I, I have lived the privileged side of cosmopolitanism. Both my families are, are, came from enormous privilege. My uncle and great uncle were kings of Ashanti and my, um, my great grandfather was the labor leader of the House of Lords. So, um, I, I, uh, and, and my grandfather was Chancellor of the Exchequer for that matter. So. I, I, our background was one of, was as it were the other kind of the other kind of cosmopolitanism in a way the easiest kind of cosmopolitanism the, the cosmopolitanism of elites and I'm I think one of Shayla's great contributions is to be remind us that that's only a tiny tiny part of the story. Thank you both for for letting us into those more personal um, histories. Needless to say, the term cosmopolitanism 
has come to mean very different things to different people. Even within the context of political philosophy, the concept carries a variety of meanings, although perhaps most commonly it's come to represent the extension of certain norms or institutions beyond the bounds of nation and nationality. For some, uh, the term is also used to signify particular characteristics of the world we inhabit, the deep interdependence and porousness and fluidity, for example, of different peoples and cultures. And of course, the pandemic, I think, has only underscored that characterization. So I want to start us off by asking each of you, what is your particular conception of cosmopolitanism and what makes it distinctive? And before I give you the chance to respond, I want to note that, you know, albeit in different ways, dialogue and conversation play a significant role in both your cosmopolitan theories. Shayla, perhaps we could begin with you. You, of course, approach these questions from the standpoint of discourse ethics and deliberative democracy. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have distinguished among uh, three dimensions of cosmopolitanism uh, and uh, the moral, uh, the legal slash political, it's complicated, and uh, the cultural. I think the moral thesis that we would both and many would subscribe to, I'm thinking here also of Martha Nussbaum, for example, is the conception uh, that each human individual is um, um, worth morally has equal worth and dignity. This is not a premise just for cosmopolitans, many Kantian theorists and possibly others would also agree with this promise of uh, equal worth and dignity. In that sense, cosmopolitanism, I would say ethically, is probably part of the family of universalist, uh, universalist ethics. The uh, cultural dimension of cosmopolitanism, I think, has been uh, brilliantly articulated by um, Anthony. Um, cultures borrow and learn uh, from each other. They imitate each other, they change each other, and they interact over time. I mean, if you want a, um, a brief, uh, a very brief critique of um, nationalism uh, as an ideology, it is that it conceives of the territory of the nation as a kind of uh, metal container in which only one culture is hegemonically available. Of course, this is uh, the version of natural, um, nationalism that was also uh, active and important in 19th century in bringing peoples together. There are, there are also positive aspects of this nation building ideology, but nonetheless, I think that it is uh, culturally based on false premises. My own work has concentrated more on the um, uh, legal uh, dimension of cosmopolitanism, but I would like to, the legal is not quite quite right, to pick up a term that, again, Anthony suggested, uh, citizenship of the world, to be world citizens. There are different versions of this. There is, of course, a version that comes from the Stoic tradition in antiquity, which is based on a critique of the polis and the Roman Empire. There is also a tradition uh, maybe that comes from Christianity, again, Marcus Aurelius, uh, an emphasis on uh, human uh, human friendship. I guess my starting point has been um, Immanuel Kant in the 18th in the 18th century and that uh, famous uh, small essay 1795 Perpetual Peace, which basically introduces uh, the idea of a um, world. Uh, a right, which it sounds like a very strange term, and you know, in German, Recht can mean both subjective rights and also law. And uh, Kant introduces the concept of a cosmopolitan right to refer to uh, institutions, associations, and also interactions among, um, you know, 
uh, as they interact in um, uh, outside the boundaries of the nation or uh, um, and of course, maybe to clarify this a bit, this is the age of the development of empire. And in that sense, some of the project of cosmopolitanism is tied in to um, uh, Western expansion, and this is justifiably pointed out by critics. But to go back to go back to Kant, Kant is the first way to uh, uh, understand um, uh, or to to bring the notion of Welt. Uh, Bürgerschaft, uh, citizenship of the world, onto the onto the agenda. And Kant is interesting also because, in many ways, he's a Republican cosmopolitan and criticizes the idea of a world state. Okay, so much of my work has concentrated on this on this Kantian tradition as it also extends into the developments of post World War II. Um, uh, with the establishment of the United Nations, the tremendous development of international human rights law and um, its impact, but I think we will be we will be talking about this uh, further on. Now, what is the significance of uh, dialogue? Um, a dialogue in all this. One of um, my Theses in philosophy as well and philosophical ethics has been that uh, the conception of universalism, uh, conception of the human or be as a universal, has always had certain anthropological, religious, and ethnic assumptions. Who is the human as such? Okay. And we all know this, this, the, the critiques uh, that have been raised by uh, feminist theorists, race scholars, etc., about the presuppositions of what defines the human. For example, why rationality, uh, the implications of rationality. Now, the concept of dialogue emphasizes that our humanity is also to be discovered in conversation and in interaction with each other. And this is um, a, um, a point to speak uh, with, uh, um, if you wish, with Wittgenstein. We are always, however, in this conversation in media stress, we are, we are in the middle. If we do not assume some respect and equality for each other, we would not even be engaging in the conversation. And I'm thinking, uh, having just listened to President uh, Biden, when he says, let us end this uncivil war, let us learn to talk to each other, let us learn to see each other. And I said, discourse ethics. <laughs> and uh, discourse ethics is important in democracy. You cannot have democracy without that. And it's fragile. It breaks down under conditions. So, But the idea of dialogue is that we always already presuppose some stance towards the other, but it is in the course of the conversation also that we can challenge our thin conceptions of respect and equality and human uh, worth um, and the like. So discourse ethics and in that sense, dialogue very much go together for me in terms of understanding or you know, or giving a new meaning to the concept of um, universalism. Thank you. Anthony, you characterize the Cosmopolitan Project as one of conversation, um, but conversation understood not only as literal talk, but also as imagine, imaginative, excuse me, engagement with the concrete experiences and ideas of others. So. You know, within a philosophical tradition that tends to emphasize the role of reason, your cosmopolitanism emphasizes the role of imagination and of our shared capacity for imaginative engagement. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, especially in light of, of Shayla's comments? Right. I mean, I think that, uh, let me just, it, it'll help, I think, to connect what I want to say about conversation just back to one thing 
about the question of how I conceive of cosmopolitanism. I very much agree with Shayla that um, cosmopolitanism belongs in the in the universalist family. You've got to start with the idea. You can't be a cosmopolitan if you don't think that everybody matters and that there's some notion of equality undergirding that, uh, that, that everybody matters, as it were, in the same way. But the second thing, and this distinguishes us from many, many uh, cosmopolitans. It distinguishes us from Catholic cosmopolitans. It distinguishes us from Muslim cosmopolitans. It distinguishes us from Marxist cosmopolitans. Uh, I mean, from Marxist universalists, sorry. Is that we take it for granted that people are going to construct individual and collective lives that are different from one another, and that that's okay, that we're not in the, the, the universalism isn't about making everybody the same. It's about everybody mattering in the context of accepting that we're not the same, that we are different, that we have, to use Rawlsian language, uh, different conceptions of the good, of the good life and so on, um, to, um, and that that is a, you know, at least for the imaginable future, a persisting condition. It's not going to go away. We're not going to come to agreement about how to live. And indeed, and I get this from Mill, but um, and but you don't have to get it from Mill, but I get this from Mill. Um, individual people make their lives by making choices about these fundamental questions that are uh, up to them. That's what Mill meant by individuality. It's up to you to make your life. And the big, there are, of course, ethical constraints. Everybody matters. So there are things you can't choose to do. You can't choose to be engaged in genocide. That's not one of the options. Uh, nor is disrespect for people on the grounds of gender or sexual orientation or race or, or and so on. Those are not the options. But there's a huge range of options about how to make your life, ranging from the professional options. You know, it would be a terrible world in which everybody was a philosopher. But it would also be a terrible world in which the people who want to be philosophers weren't allowed to be philosophers. And the same goes for novelists and poets and bankers and lawyers and politicians and everything. We, we've, we, the world is great. The human world is great in part because people make different choices about these things. And other people have, again, to use million language, different experiments of living. They're trying out different options. And I might be attracted to an option that I see somebody else living out, but I might not. But as a cosmopolitan, I accept that it's up to them, provided they live within the, 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 the constraints set by morality, uh, to make choice about these value choices for themselves. And that sort of generates, as it were, two things. First of all, it generates the, the cultural dimension of cosmopolitanism because it makes you curious. People are doing these different things. Uh, uh, if you travel... If you travel imaginatively with Basho on the narrow road to the deep north, you know, a, a, a several centuries old Japanese haiku poet, um, you get access in your imagination to things that you wouldn't get if you just read Robert Frost, whom I love as well. Uh, and uh, you won't get everything valuable in literature from Shakespeare and Tolstoy, though I love Shakespeare and Tolstoy. So... Um, that sense that that this that this fundamental sense that each person is making a life and one of the things they're doing is deciding among value options that th they're up to them that they have the right both individually and as communities to decide on that's very important part i think of, of the form of the picture that i believe in now against that background you can see why you want to be conversable, as Hume said. You want to be talking to people uh, who are... Because because they're doing this other thing. And you can learn more if you talk to people who are doing the other thing. And uh, or the other things, uh, of whom there are too many for you to have conversations with all of them. And so... Um, and, you know, you could stick with actual conversation, but that would require you to be uh, one of those privileged... <laughs> The, the, the have the highest privileges, which is to have an American passport and be able to force your way in anywhere. Uh, and um, and but that's not going to work. Uh, a because unfortunately we don't have a world in which all passports are equal. But second, because uh, not all of us have the, the time to go to Brazil and and um, to to be with trailer in Istanbul, as I once had the privilege of being, and so on. Not all of us have 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 the time or the or the money or the or the desire to do that. 
but we can all engage with elsewhere through the imagination. So I think that that's one. And, and so that extension of the, the um, you know, global citizenship is a metaphor. If, if we were to be citizens, uh, politas of, of the cosmos, we'd have to have a cosmopolis. We'd have to have a world state. We don't. So we can't be literal citizens. So we have to make the metaphor work. Conversation, I think, is a useful metaphor too. And just to end, one of the important things about conversation as a metaphor is that real normal human conversation, the thing that anthropologists do when they arrive in a new place, is not directed at anything in particular. You're being with people in the deepest human way, which is exchanging words. Um, but you don't, uh, uh, it's not a lecture, nor is it an inquiry in which your task is to find out. It's not like, you're not, it's not forensic, you're not interrogating people, right? You're just being with them in this conversational way and you're learning and the conversation goes where it goes. Nobody's in charge. And that's to get back to the point Shayla was stressing, uh, the importance of not just of universality, but of equality as a background to these exchanges, that the most valuable form of, of conversation is a conversation among equals. We are not equals in the actual world. It, it, we're not descriptively equals. We are normatively equals, but we're not descriptively equals. And that we have something, I think it's very important to bear in mind when we are engaging with other people that we have to think, given my, you know, all of us are, operate by global standards from positions of relative privilege, how can I enter the conversation with this person who's not privileged in the ways that I am and still um, live up to the ideal of equal exchange? Well, one of the charges that's, that's frequently raised against the Cosmopolitan Project, whether it's in philosophy or in public discourse, is that it's disconnected from the immediate texture of our local and national communities, that it's domain of relevance, so to speak, um, is some abstract transnational space inaccessible to most human beings. And of course, you know, speaking of privilege, we've all become quite fam familiar in recent years with populist expressions of this objection that, you know, far from reflecting the real needs and aspirations of humanity, cosmopolitanism is just the exclusive tribe of choice for an aloof set of frequent flyers uh, sitting in a gated airport lounge on their way to Davos. But I think this charge of elitism aside, the domain of the cosmopolitan project is often assumed by cosmopolitan theorists themselves to lie beyond and across national borders, not within them. In other words, the cosmopolitan project typically isn't thought to be a project about morality or ethics or politics at home. And I think, um, as we've started to discuss, your conceptions of cosmopolitanism throw some of these assumptions into question. For example, Shayla, you've argued that when human rights are appropriated by new political actors, a process of what you call democratic iteration can lead not just to changes in international and domestic law, but also to transformations of the various particular identities that are involved within societies or to transformations of national political communities and their self-conceptions more deeply. Antony, you make the case as we've discussed um, for cosmopolitanism as conversation, but conversation not just across national boundaries, but across all boundaries of difference, including very much those we find within our own societies and even within our, our local um, communities and, and neighborhoods. If, if the challenges um, we faced in recent years, and I, they have been considerable. If the challenges we faced demonstrate anything, I think it's that we need precisely this form of cosmopolitanism, a cosmopolitanism in which um, the recognition of our shared humanity finds expression as much within the boundaries of local and national communities as it does beyond them. So the question I, I wanna put to you is this, how do we promote a vision of cosmopolitanism that is as relevant as, at home as it is abroad? In other words, how can the recognition of our common humanity um, not just shape our posture toward distant others, but also remold the way we relate to each other at every level of society, including in our more local, 
and immediate communities. Anthony, why don't you begin? Well, I mean, yes, so, so that's right. I, that is uh, an important point, and I hope it's something that has come out in some of my writing, because um, the, the sort of fundamental philosophical idea, right, is that human beings are up to different things, and they're entitled to be so, and that we can learn from one another precisely because we're doing different things. But the different things being done are being done by my neighbor here, by the New Jersey policeman, who is my neighbor on the right, uh, not on the political right. I don't know anything about his politics, but uh, where my right hand is. Um, and by the ornithologist next door on, on, on the left. And, um, and so we come to each other. I'm much closer in, um, in many aspects of my experience to, to Shayla than I am to either of my neighbors. And certainly, uh, you know, I have common experiences uh, with lots of people in other countries that I don't have with most Americans. Uh, but if the, if the fundamental point is that people are entitled to live lives that they make, and then that point applies everywhere. It applies at home, of course. And that means that now the, the, the challenge at home is that on the very local level, um, we are regulating our lives together in a much more detailed and concrete way than I am co-regulating my life with the lives of people in Lagos or, or, uh, or Lima or uh, Lahore. And um, so here we are, I'm in this tiny village in, uh, it's called a town here, but where I grew up, these things were called villages because there's only a couple of thousand people in it. And um, and we have local school boards and things like that, and we have rules about how frequent how frequently there should be electric plugs along the baseboards of our of our rooms, which were made by us by a few thousand of us, and nobody in Lahore is telling me where to plug in my plugs. So um, the the ch often the local challenge, because of the concreteness and specificity of the regulations that we are making together can be harder than the transnational challenge. Because in the end, the answer to the question whether it'll be eight feet or 12 feet is going to be set here. And I may have strong feelings about that. And if I, if, if I were, if I'd been raised in America, I'd have the strong, I'd have stronger the feeling that it's, um, and it's an assault on my liberty that anyone's telling me how frequently I have to put plugs in my building, right? And so those of us who want regulations about these things have to talk to people who think like that. So yes, absolutely. Uh, we we live, and, and differences being generated all the time and mostly locally, that's where it comes from. And so of course, if we are going to respect people across difference, recognize that they have the right to make their own lives but also live side by side with them as neighbors, literal neighbors, not as figurative neighbors, then we are going to have to attend to their differences in, I would say, in an even deeper way, because we're, we're as it were, stuck, to, stuck with one another with our differences. And so we are going to have to sort it out. I don't have to come to agreement with most people in the world about many things. I can be interested in their views and I can value the fact that they hold strongly views that I don't. When it comes to settling the matter of what we shall do here in Pennington, New Jersey, I can't be so laissez-faire. I've got to, because we've got to do one thing or the other here. So, um, and that openness, that willingness to converse is therefore an enormous political resource locally, if we can mobilize it, which we can't at the moment. We're having a very hard time in our country right now, this United States. Uh, mobilizing that will to conversation, which uh, because precisely because it needs to be the background. In the end, you don't, you're not conversing, you're legislating, right? That's not conversation. But conversation needs to be in the background. And, and people who are conversing with one another make laws together more easily, even though they disagree, than people who don't talk to one another, either figuratively or literally, who don't understand one another, in other words. 
Shayla, I'm eager to get your response to this question, which intersects, I think, um, not just with the work you've done to reconcile the tension between the universal and the particular, but also with elements of your work that question a specific framing of that tension, namely a framing that tends to cast the universal as abstract, disembodied, and rational on the one hand, and the particular as concrete, embodied, and emotionally constituted on the other. Uh, my screen is freezing a bit, but you know, Shada, there are so many dimensions to the question that you asked, particularly about uh, cosmopolitanism, the local and the national. And um, in recent years, uh, the antagonism towards um, globalization, that big G word that we have avoided so far, <laughs> has taken the form of a kind of theoretical antagonism towards the project of cosmopolitanism. And if I may just you know, begin there, I think it's extremely important for us to understand that this particular stage in the development of world capitalism, which is financially driven neoliberal capitalism, I don't mind if this sounds good old fashioned Marxist, that this has created winners and losers. And uh, it has led to increased inequality and stratification. And part of the antagonism that you sense against cosmopolitans, I mean, look at the number of times in the Republican convention, globalists and cosmopolitans were denounced, right? Where this is coming from is partially, you know, at, at least I think not partially, even I would say dominantly, a kind of world economic system that has run amok. For me, it is very important to distinguish the political and ethical project of cosmopolitanism from the endorsement of any kind of particular world economy or economic project. In fact, I don't. And I think that people who criticize uh, some of the populist criticism of this particular world economic condition is quite justifiable. And I understand when uh, there is um, a national anxiety and resentment about uh, elites uh, with the loss of jobs and so on. So the question is, as uh, Anthony also was saying, can we find a way of talking around these issues? OK, take the paradoxes. Um, just like going from the philosophical to the everyday, right? About 70% of everything in an American household right now is made in China. That's just the case. Go to any, any store. Go to the kind of to stores that middle America will use, not Six, Fifth, uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, but, you know, Marshalls, Kmart. Look at how these prices are kept down. I'm sorry, I don't want to get off topic, but this is part of what the discourse concerning cosmopolitanism is these days, namely that the world ha has become increasingly one and equally divided. Um, you know, um, in the 18th century, uh, it would take months for a letter from Istanbul to arrive in Paris, okay? For us now, uh, we live simply in a world that has grown smaller. And yet in this, in this context, uh, we have not uh, articulated rules of cooperation and coexistence that make nations not go on the defense. Besides, I don't believe in the contrast between the local, between the home and the world. I think the world contains the home and uh, the world can be, it, it, is incre it is our home. This planet is the only home our species has, right? So the, the dilemma at the sociological and political level, if you wish, 
is that we have interdependence that has contributed to inequality rather than um, a sense of development together and mutual and mutuality. And this is a criticism uh, of um, cosmopolitanism and that, that I take that I take very very seriously. Now, at a more abstract level, modern nations are built on cosmopolitan principles. The constitution of every modern nation begins with a preamble on human rights. Then the paradox is, you know, whether we hold these truths to be self-evident because it is we the people. The tension then is with the cosmopolitan intention that is embodied in all constitutions, whether Turkish, whether Chilean, whether Brazilian, uh, whether Ghanaian, probably, whether, you know, American, right? Uh, this is the 18th century project that is the project of a constitutional democracy. So we, on the one hand, these tr- have these transcendent ideas, and on the other hand, we locate them um, as principles that should govern and guide guide the nation. So it is this uh, conflict between Universal human rights, that's the cosmopolitan legacy of the Enlightenment, and popular sovereignty, that is also another legacy, and the tension. And what we find in populist movements in our days is that popular sovereignty becomes embodied, almost represented in an autocrat, by an autocrat, by a single individual, and hence the tension that is the tension embedded in all modern constitutions gets simplified in very dangerous in very dangerous um, directions. So I guess um, for me, you know, beginning with the um, more philosophical point about the embodied universal and the concrete universal, which in our goes back to Hegel, in fact, but it 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 acts at every at every level. And you know, I guess what I'm looking for, or trying to develop in my view of cosmopolitanism, is this interaction of the universal and the particular, you know, at all uh, at all levels. And um, I feel, as I said, uh, it's very important to. Uh, not to be not to be just uh, pushed up against the wall uh rootless you know cosmopolitan I mean, we know that term is a very is a term with a very ugly history as well but i think anthony and many others have also said rooted cosmopolitanism and we want to we want to think about that including taking into account the tremendous winners and losers of the Current global uh, economy and where we go with that. I completely agree. I mean, look, I think um, uh, you, you can get you can you can get clips of uh, President Obama criticizing cosmopolitan elites, Elizabeth Warren criticizing cosmopolitan elites, uh, Josh Hawley criticizing cosmopolitan elites on the, on the other end of the political spectrum. Uh, Bernie Sanders doesn't seem to like cosmopolitan elites very much either. Um, and so this is a this is the, this is a, a cosmopolitans are apparently equally offensive uh, across the spectrum at the moment, and I think this is just because of a series of very profound misunderstandings. Look, if the fundamental thought is that everybody matters, how can it be okay that people in Scranton are suffering because of the end of the steel industry? It's 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 terrible that people are suffering in Bangladesh too. But <laughs> people in Scranton are people, and if people matter, and we have a special responsibility for the people who are our fellow citizens, that's what national 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 organisation means. We take we, we we take special political responsibility each of us for some territory within which we're organised as a political unit, and that might be Pennington, it might be New Jersey, it might be the United States, and it might be uh, the North, North America and the North American uh, free trade area and so on. In all of these, we're operating um, with local 
increasingly large, but still uh, local responsibilities that are more substantial than our general responsibilities to everybody. So how could it be that anyone can blame cosmopolitans for this? Cosmopolitans are the people who, say, who, uh, who are, as Shayla started by saying, we're a species of universalists. If this is wrong, it's wrong. And uh, how could a cosmopolitan be in favour of it? So why is this mistake being made? Uh, sometimes these mistakes are made just because people are trying to distract us. Uh, Josh Hawley is making this mistake because he thinks that he can appeal to chauvinism uh, to get people to support his political policies. And so he wants to blame the world for America's problems and and the openness of America to the world for America's problems. So he wants us to be against um, against immigration and he wants us to be against uh, allowing global capital to do its dirty business. Uh, look, Globalization has been very complicated, what we call globalization. First of all, it's a very long process. It's been going on for a very long time. It was already up and running in the 18th century. But, but the thing that has happened significantly in the last few decades, uh, the, uh, the, as, as Shayla says, focuses on the globalization of finance, I think, and of trade. It's, it's not been a globalization of movement. Um, it's, if you trust me, Ghanaians know how hard it is to cross borders. But, uh, but, but they do know, they also know that if they want uh, dollars from their cousins in the United States, they can come across the border freely. So it, it, it's, it's not a globalization of everything economic, it's, a, it's not a globalization of labor. Because if, if with true gl labor globalization would, 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 would allow free migration. Um, but, but it has had some tremendously important positive effects. Asia's I mean, the, the, the pandemic has set us very badly back in, in this economic dimension, and hundreds of millions of people have been shoved back into poverty. But we were making enormous progress in Asia, in, in India and, and uh, China in particular, but also in Southeast Asia, um, in taking people out of poverty. And that's one of the things that this form of globalization has achieved. So two things have happened at the same time, and people, I think, are confused about them. One thing, as Shada correctly says, is a huge increase in inequality. That's also a fact. Uh, but that increase in inequality has been combined with a reduction in poverty in some places mm -hmm. and an increase in poverty in others. <laughs> in other words, the effects have been very uh, uneven and the good effects have been very uneven, which is why the winners and losers are not all uh, concentrated in one in one place by any means, that there are lots of winners in Ghana, lots of losers in Ghana. There are lots of winners in the United States, lots of losers in the United States. And as Shayla was pointing out, among the winners in the United States, and here we have to think of ourselves in the economy as occupying different positions, uh, are American consumers, right? Kmart wouldn't be that cheap if those goods weren't all coming from China, being produced by lower paid workers in China, who are still better off than they would have been if they hadn't been lower wage, lower wage workers in China, lower than the United States, uh, as a result of globalization. So it's a complicated thing, and people are trying to muddle it up by simplifying and by ignoring this very simple fact. That financial globalization has produced a total increase in wealth. The political challenge is to distribute it fairly right? There's no point in increasing the wealth if all the increase in wealth is going to people who already have more than enough. What's the point of it? Wealth isn't a, wealth isn't a, a magical thing. It isn't something that matters in itself. It matters because of what people can do with it. And if you give it, to, if you, if you give it all to 17 billionaires or 70 billionaires or whatever, whatever it is now, uh, I don't know how many billionaires are in the world, an awful lot. Um, I don't care about, I don't care about, I don't want that. I, that doesn't interest me at all. So we need to figure out if we're going to use globalization to generate wealth, and by the way, that if is important because of the things we haven't been talking about to do with, the, with ecology, but um, if we're going to do that, then we ought to think about how to make sure that, that, that we use some of that wealth in Scranton to make opportunities to people whose opportunities this wealth producing process for some people has taken away. So I think, and that's um, that can be done. Look, uh, the, the pre- before taxes and transfers, the, uh, there's, a, there's a measure of inequality called the Gini coefficient. It doesn't matter what it is, but there's a, let's just take that. Uh, before taxes and transfers, the Gini coefficient of Sweden and the United States are the same. Capitalism does its 
concentrating thing in both places. But in Sweden, the, the Gini coefficient after taxes and transfers is much lower because they decided, rightly, to share the thing in a better way than we have. So I think, and have I said anything inconsistent with cosmopolitanism in the last <laughs> couple of minutes? Of course not. Uh, so I think blaming cosmopolitans for this, it's true that some of the elites who are responsible for this and who are behaving irresponsibly, and here I agree with President Obama's critique of cosmopolitan elites in his Mandela lecture, of course there are irresponsible people. Um, some of those people are genuinely cosmopolitan in some ways, they're cultural cosmopolitans, they're genuinely engaged culture, they read novels from all over the place and they go to concerts all over the place and they, they spend some of their money in art museums where they buy stuff from Ghanaian artists, uh, even though they're not Ghanaian. Um, but they're not, I think, uh, taking sufficient care about the fundamental moral dimension of cosmopolitanism, which is the thing that Shaina started with, it's universalism. And that means all these people matter. And we're, we're not behaving as if they matter. And the fact that we're not behaving as if people matter in Scranton is just as bad as, uh, you know, behaving as if people don't matter in Soweto. Those are both bad things. And the cosmopolitan should care about both of them. We have special responsibility in our own communities, but we have a general sense of responsibility to the whole world. In our conversation thus far, we, we've been able to reflect on some of the conceptual tensions that are raised when discussing cosmopolitanism, whether rightfully or not, between the global and the local, the universal and the, um, the particular. And there's another one of the core conceptual questions that arises when thinking about cosmopolitanism, which is its relationship to liberalism as a tradition of practice and thought. Um, so to put it bluntly, to some, it can seem as if being a cosmopolitan today entails embracing at some level the ideal uh, of a liberal political order on the global stage, or at least the, the acceptance globally of a liberal ethical framework. Now, one of the obvious and major problems with this assumption is that throughout history and around the world, many of the intellectual and political systems that at least on some level could be meaningfully described as cosmopolitan in, have not been decidedly liberal in nature. So one thinks here of not just the classical cosmopolitanisms of the cynics and the stoics, but also of variants that arose uh, in Buddhist or Hindu or Chinese or Abrahamic contexts, as well as in quite obviously a wide variety of imperial configurations. One could also point to a range of contemporary thinkers, ranging potentially from Mohandas Gandhi to Karl Marx, as examples of cosmopolitanisms who do not embrace a neatly liberal framework of thought. Still, given the prominent role that liberalism plays in structuring um, our implicit social imaginary, it can be legitimately difficult to envision how cosmopolitan convictions might expand their global reach in a manner that doesn't uh, depend upon the prior acceptance, acceptance of liberal ethics or a liberal vision of governance. So how then might we understand the contemporary significance of these extra liberal strands of cosmopolitan practice and thought? In the spirit of conversation and dialogue that both of you mentioned, how might they be important to understand, to make room for, even to potentially learn from in contemporary debates on issues of global import? Um, Anthony, perhaps we could begin with you. So I, th I think of liberalism as a, a, a large family of views uh, which have developed historically. So it, it doesn't, liberalism, like all these interesting families of views, doesn't really have an essence. So I can't say what I what I think. <laughs> I mean, my liberalism is basically a, a combination of thinking that it's important for, uh, for, that, for there to be a systems of rights, both national and transnational, and that um, uh, uh, the other part of the Universal Declaration, that there are basic conditions of social uh, and educational and uh, cultural uh, uh, resources that everybody's entitled to have, that there's a, there's a fundamental baseline of things that everybody's entitled to have. It doesn't matter whether you call that liberalism or not. That's, I'm just telling you that's where I'm coming from. Um, that, and, uh, but I do think that that's a very recognizably sort of liberal bundle, um, even though it's not the only liberal bundle. Look, um, that's a, a bundle that combines, in my view, easily with cosmopolitanism. But it's by no means, as you're pointing out, the only bundle that does. And what makes me a cosmopolitan is my willingness to engage with people who have different views about everything, including this. Uh, I don't think we should make it a condition of entry to the conversation, actually, even that people agree on the rights thing. Um, 
I'm going to disagree with people who enter the conversation not uh, not uh, believing in the right thing, and I'm going to argue with them and try to persuade them, and I'm going to use the argumentative resources available, which, as you point out, don't just come from Western Europe. I teach regularly now. A third of the content of my global ethics class is stuff for, uh, is, is stuff written by Muslim uh, intellectuals uh, over the last uh, gosh thousand years, I suppose. Um, and uh, it's full of good ideas about how to make the world uh, better. Uh, and, I, I, and as you know, uh, many contemporary uh, Muslim thinkers have found uh, roots and uh, ways to get to, people like Abdullah and Amin, and I am, have found ways to get to th things that I think of as, as you know, very, very con consistent with, uh, uh, with, with liberalism, but from, from a different place. I value those conversations, and the same is true of the other third of my courses about Confucians and Neo-Confucians. And again, there are lots and lots of resources in those parts of the world and in those traditions, which are now global, uh, to, to do that. So that's what the cosmopolitan is going to do. The cosmopolitan in me is not, I have a view, Right, and my view is, yeah, it's a liberal view. But my, but my cosmopolitan side of me says that's what I come with. That's what I bring to the conversation. That's what I have to offer. Right. That's why it's a fair deal when I come to the conversation because I'm bringing something. I'm not just taking. But I respect the others, and so what they bring is of interest to me too. And if they're willing to discuss it uh, and teach me, and, and willing to perhaps learn from me. That's great too. So I do not think of cosmopolitans as insisting as a condition of entry into the into the conversation that you accept a list of doctrines uh, derivable from John Locke or Immanuel Kant. Uh, no, um, or, or for that matter, from the American founding. Uh, but uh, or the French Revolution or whatever whatever your favorite liberal sources are, um, but I but I have them and my view is in the cosmopolitan conversation that's what I'm bringing. So I'm a liberal cosmopolitan, but not a cosmopolitan who insists that everybody be a liberal. Indeed, I think that would be uncosmopolitan. So Shayla, I wanted to ask a follow up question on the same theme, but that's framed a bit more in terms of your notion of democratic iterations. As I understand the idea, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, the idea of a democratic iteration is meant to capture a process whereby a democratic society can potentially rearticulate its sense of collective identity system of and its system of enacted laws in response to an evolving understanding of the cosmopolitan, the universal implications of human rights. I wonder how this concept might be applied to something like the Paris Accord, um, which clearly marked a milestone in the global adoption of cosmopolitan ideals, yet was embraced by democratic and non-democratic societies alike. What then does it mean when polities like China or Saudi Arabia alter their basic legal and economic structures in response to a growing understanding of the requirements of global environmental citizenship? Would this constitute evidence of there being something like a cosmopolitan iteration, to use uh, to riff off of your phrase, and taking place in the world today, beyond the reach, per se, of democratic governance? And if so, how might better understanding this dynamic change the way we think about the nature and possibilities of global politics? Um, uh, yes, complicated question, but maybe I can um, uh, say uh, just by way of starting that I um, uh, very much agree with Anthony about uh, the idea of understanding liberalism as a broad family of um, uh, values. And um, let me say that for me personally, um, uh, one of the contentions about with philosophical liberalism I would have, coming as I do from a more Hegelian tradition of intersubjectivity, I am not in agreement with the uh, empirical assumptions about formation of individuality in classic liberalism. Uh, not in Locke, not in Kant, uh, um, not even in Mill, okay? So there are different uh, philosophical conceptions, or if you wish, there can be different philosophical anthropologies underlying the conception of the person 
uh, that liberalism defends. And if I may go back for a second, uh, I'm not forgetting your question, to an important debate that we had in uh, philosophy and political theory, you know, public debate. I mean, it's 50 years now since the publication of John Rawls's important book, A Theory of Justice, in 19. 19- 72, and I probably, like Anthony and others, have written so many articles over the years agreeing and disagreeing with Rawls, but always coming back in my own mind to this enormous contribution, what he wanted to call political liberalism. The, and what is the essence of political liberalism? I never agreed uh, with um the thin philosophical anthropology at the beginning of a theory of justice. And some would say, look, you know, by the time you get to the end of that tremendous work, what we are talking about is a full-fledged conception of the good. And um, uh, Rawls's vision uh, develops, etc. I'm going back to Rawls because also because I think we very much need to continue this philosophical conversation about liberalism today, because under the tremendous uh, sort of worldwide rise of populism, it's as if many liberals have become tongue-tied, but they shouldn't. What I appreciate about Rawls's concept of political liberalism, as opposed to other conceptions of, uh, of the personal society, etc., is that I think he is spot on when he says, uh, look, um, in a liberal society where we are um, citizens, I'd like to use members because there are also non-citizen members in any in any society of the world today. We are engaged in a project, in some kind of a project of uh, collective governance and distribution. And to be engaged in this project, we have to assume about the other person that they not only have their conceptions of the good, as Anthony was saying, whatever that may be, but that they are also capable of respecting each other as persons engaged in these pursuits in accordance with a certain framework, right? So what has happened now is that basis of respect of persons for each other, that has been uh, seriously undermined. And that has economic as well as cultural technological causes, the new media, growing inequality, et cetera. But uh, there's also been challenges about the framework. If we accept the liberal conception of the good, does that mean that if I believe that abortion is murder, that I have to live with that belief, right? I mean, some of the big debates of the last 20 years in liberal polities that have left everyone um, sort of divided at times, confused, et cetera. These are, these are very, very difficult, uh, difficult issues. And I do see the project of cosmopolitanism as being um, part of a family with the, the project of political uh, liberalism. But I would say that uh, political liberalism is not possible just in one territorially circumscribed polity. So the challenge then has become, and I'm coming to democratic iterations, is can we think really of transnational modes of uh, governance that would respect some of these principles? Uh, Tall order, very difficult, very difficult because Uh, You know, in the United Nations, the principle is that sovereignty does not mean interference in internal regimes. Well, we know that, you know, nations always, states are always interfering in each other. They are always interacting with each other, uh, etc. But the challenge is going to be for us, uh, what do we do uh, with the majority of non-liberal People's democracies. Now, how do we how do we deal with this? Now, um, 
democratic iterations for me is a useful concept um, because uh, um, it has several dimensions. Uh, first, I started thinking of democratic iterations when I started thinking of the concept of the public sphere, the Habermasian concept of the public sphere, and how it was criticized very heavily by both uh, feminist theorists and post-colonial and critical race theorists uh, for uh, not being open enough. And uh, my good friend Nancy Fraser introduced this idea of counter-publics. Uh, Gayatri Spivak worked on this alternative counter-public. So what's happening? I thought that one way to think about this is the following. When a group of excluded individuals claim rights for themselves, be it the right to sit in the school bus equally as Rosa Parks did, or eating in the same counter, or the, the, the right to be different and yet equal. What happens, in my opinion, is that the content of that right gets iterated, not just repeated, but expanded and transformed because a new voice, a new subjectivity has engaged, engaged with it. Our concept of equality after the civil rights movement can never be can never be the same. In fact, a lot of racists in, in Europe say la droit uh, à la différence, the right to difference, they interpret as the right to express oneself, but not to be muddled, not to have to go to each other's countries, et cetera, right? So there, there are interesting dimensions there. But in this process of democratic iteration, not only does our understanding of the right change, but our understanding of the person, of the person who is a rights claimant changes, and also the topics of the conversation change. And for me, the best example of this is um, women's movements and also, you know, the gay, lesbian um, um, uh, movements also that, uh, uh, how? Because the, the traditional concept of the public also involves a division between the public and the private. Now, I believe in a robust conception of human privacy, right? But this robust conception of human privacy need not, you know, does not mean that something like um, sexual abuse of children uh, child battering, discrimination against gay, um, uh, by gender, gender fluid individuals, that these issues cannot be discussed. These are difficult conversations. But if we take the example of the, of the uh, women's uh, movement, the democratic, the democratic iteration of, you know, the idea of sexual violence and sexual violence in the family, let me give you uh, an example from countries like uh, Turkey and also Israel, which will then enable me to get back, you know, to the Paris Accord. Because in many societies, it is very difficult to have a conversation about sexual domestic violence, domestic violence, because of loyalty to family members. In fact, we know uh, that there is a great deal of domestic violence in Turkey. And we know that in some, in certain periods and communities in Israeli society, there has also been domestic violence. Now, it's very difficult for, uh, and it's usually women, not exclusively, but usually, uh, women and girls to make a claim because they are not only um, betraying their relatives in doing so, they're also possibly shaming themselves, right? Shaming themselves. And to this day, you know, in countries like uh, Pakistan, in fact, a woman who brings charges of rape is immediately suspected of herself being uh, of loose sexual morals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Yet at the same time, if you know you have let's say emerging out of uh, something like the Cairo uh, um, a declaration, you know, on women's rights, the CEDA, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Declaration Against Discrimination Against Women, there are then offices that open up in these countries if they are signatories to CEDA. And a movement from below starts. This this can be documented. This is not just philosophical theory. One of the important impacts of these transnational uh, rights agreements is that member countries are obligated to develop, to give them numbers. What is the occurrence of violation of CEDA? And these local women's offices that start opening up they actually create a conversation from below. So I'm interested in the conversation from above and the conversation from below and how they interact. And there is plenty, plenty of evidence for how empirically some of the uh, human rights are are doing this. So to come back to your um, uh, question about the uh, Paris Accord, why should we exclude the possibility that there will be an ecological movement in China? There may even be one already. We don't know. We know that China's tremendous industrial catch-up development in the last 40, 50 years has also meant an incredible price that their environment has has paid. I mean, uh, you know, there are many Chinese cities are much more polluted than uh, Los Angeles or New York. So uh, it, it's not it's not clear to me, therefore, that you know the Paris Accord is just like a fantasy of the liberal imagination. It will have an impact on people's development precisely because, and this is my last point, I'm sorry, this has gone on a little. The last point is that if anything has taught us that we need to take the planet seriously, it's the COVID pandemic. You know, epidemiologists are telling us that it may not end, unfortunately, precisely because some kind of balance between life forms has also been interrupted. So how can we not take planetary consciousness consciousness seriously? So the Paris Accord is not some, it may have its problems, et cetera, but it's not some flimsy uh, sort of, you know, imagination, liberal imagination that has come up with it. It's the health of the planet. And as far as I can tell, it's the only home we have so far. I mean, let, let me just say that it seems to me that part of what you're insisting on which a cosmopolitan should agree with, is that uh, there are lots of things for us to work on together. Democracy isn't the only one. Shayla and I are very committed to democracy. Uh, we recognise, because we're cosmopolitans, that there's not there's more than one way of doing democracy, and that there isn't, as it were, one constitution that we, we want to impose on everybody in the world. People have to work these things out in their own ways. But, but we would like our country to be, I would like my country, the United States, of which I'm a citizen, to be more democratic than it currently is. Um, I'd like I'd like China to be more democratic than it currently is. Um, but we don't have to, we shouldn't let the, 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 as it were, the best be the enemy of the good. If we can make agreements with China about how to solve the, 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 the or to begin to approach solving the problems of the, of the ecological problems, but let's do it. I mean, let's not sacrifice the Uyghurs to that. Let's not forget that bad things are going on in China in the human rights domain. And let's not forget that China is committed because it has signed up. It is a signatory to these international agreements. It is committed to not doing the things that it's currently doing, which are in violation not just of international law, but actually, if you read it, of the Chinese constitution. So um, we, we don't have to, we can work with them on, on you know, we can, we can as um somebody was saying the other day about about uh, about our own country we can manage to do more than one thing at a time uh, we can work on the environment with the world as it is which includes a lot of not very democratic states and some pretty anti-democratic ones but we can also work towards the democratization of the planet understanding that in a cosmopolitan way as meaning that 
different traditions of democracy will develop in different places and that we will respect the decisions of local societies, provided they respect the rights, uh, the, the broad system of rights that we've all now agreed to. I want to move us along. This is such a fascinating conversation, um, but we only have about 15 minutes left, and I'd like to get a few more questions in before we have to wrap up. So um, uh, I'll put a couple of them to you, and perhaps you can handle them um, as concisely as possible. I want to shift topics just slightly. You know, each of you has written both about cosmopolitanism and about identity, but without necessarily merging or marrying the two. Is there or um, can there be such a thing as a universal human identity from your perspective? And if so, what role does it play in the future of cosmopolitanism? Uh, in this connection, Shayla, you argue that the institution of citizenship has been disaggregated in recent years, meaning that certain civil, social, and political rights have been unbundled from national identity and belonging, most notably in Europe. So I'm, I'm wondering, could a broader, more universal form of identity and belonging emerge and become rebundled, so to speak, with more universal expressions of democracy or citizenship? Um, no. <laughs> universal identity is not quite the right terminology. Identities are always... Um, uh, concrete, <laughs> insofar as we are embodied human beings, um, we are <laughs> uh, uh, in the world as body, but who we are now, to pick up another one of my favorite philosophers, Hannah Arendt, who we are is always told as a narrative. It's always a tale, and it's this tale that is complex and multivocal and multidimensional. And this is where the concrete universal comes in, that it is Antony's uh, tale of uh, Ghana and a particular moment in the UK. It's uh, my tale of uh, coming from a, a minority, religious minority that then just becomes a Turkish citizen with the declaration of the Republic and what I go through. So who one is, okay, in the first place is identified narratively. It's always the, the, a tale that we tell, uh, but this is the tale of an embodied, embodied self. Because uh, we know that uh, individuals carry their history also not uh, just in their tales and narratives, but also in their in their bodies. I mean, after after Freud, you know, we can't we can't uh, forget you know the unconscious and the way in which um, we also carry that which is not that which is not said. Um, if, you know, these sort of philosophical approaches uh, embodied self and narrativity, narrative identity make, make sense, um, I think uh, uh, the answer to uh, your uh, question may also be um, a, a, the development of a kind of a narrative of, um, I don't know how to put it, narrative of togetherness, planetary planetary inter, interdependence. And I mean, uh, good literature always does this. You know, it 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 brings us it brings us together as as human beings and good art does this and as philosophers maybe what we can we can contribute to it is also um, interpret interpret uh, 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 interpret art and you know uh, to go back to one of Anthony's themes um, to make the imagination work. 
And uh, the theme of the imagination is so deeply tied into universal universal identity. So, you know, the response to the to your question is um, uh, there will be n- narratives and stories and tales of the development of such an uh, such an identity. And by the way, the story of um, nationhood, not nationalism, but what Roger Smith calls nationhood, how a people forms itself as a nation, is going to be has a very important role uh, in that. So I don't want to completely dismiss one of the most important collective identities that you know people have and and share and and you know are are proud are proud of there's a lot more that can be said but you've asked us to be well, succinct maybe, so. maybe I'll put the question then to, to Anthony you know you, you're also very clear that the goal of the cosmopolitan process you envision is not to necessarily arrive at agreement or a shared identity. It's to get to know those with whom we disagree and learn to live alongside them. But I have to say, when I went back and reread some of your work, I wondered whether you might actually be selling your own cosmopolitan short. I wondered, in other words, whether engaging in meaningful conversation across lines of difference with a humble a humble posture of learning is not at least one key ingredient of a process that might lead not just to acceptance and cohabitation, but in fact, to a form of shared human identity or or narrative or togetherness, as Shayla has just put it. Um, So I'm the way I think about identity is that you've got to have, there are sort of three elements. One is, um, one is a set of criteria of, for deciding who's a member, who who has the identity. Uh, But uh, that just creates a sort of logical category. But then you've got to have some psychological reality to it. And the psychological reality is that it matters to somebody that they're a woman, gay, Ghanaian, Turkish. And if, if, if you've got a logical category, but it doesn't matter to anybody, it's not an identity, even though it's a, it's, it's a logical category. And then it has to have a social reality, which means that there has to be some. Uh, there have to be consequences in social life for people identifying you. And if you've got all those these things, you've got a bundle of people, boundaries usually contested, a set of things that matter to the members, and a set of things that the not, the outsiders do, uh, and the insiders do to you because you're a member. Then you, I think you've got an identity. Um, in that sense, I don't believe that humanity is an identity for most people today. But I, I entertain the possibility, I, you know, I'm not a prophet, I can't tell you what the future is going to bring. I entertain the possibility that it might become a serious identity, just as lots of other identities in the past, which were barely logical categories, became uh, social and psychological categories again uh, eventually, and so became full-fledged identities. I think there's already, though, an identity available, which um, is not going to become universal. So it meets Shayla's worry about the sort of the, the idea that we're always going to be different in our in our embodied ways, which I agree with. Uh, which is a cosmopolitan identity. <laughs> uh, again, to have an identity is not to require homogeneity. Right. So we can be different cosmopolitans, just as we can be different Americans, different Turks, different Ghanaians. Um, I happen to care deeply about being American, and I care about what happens to this country of mine that I've chosen to belong to. Um, but I'm my caring, and so do lots of other people. And what and what they care about is a different America from the one that I care about. Some of them, Mr. Mr. Trump's people, I, I'm happy to acknowledge that they care about America. The America they care about isn't the one that I care for, but they care about it too. And so they're Americans and we're in contest with one another about the meaning of an American identity. Cosmopolitans can do the same. We can be in contest about the the full meaning of the cosmopolitan identity, but still the fact that, you know, women are different doesn't mean that we don't have use for the category woman. Uh, we, We shouldn't essentialize it. We shouldn't um, we should make recognize the intersectional point that 
that what it means to be a woman is, among other things, deeply inflected by all the other identities you have, but still it's a useful category. And so I think as cosmopolitan, even though we cosmopolitans in our modest way are, are going to recognize that other people can be cosmopolitans who don't agree with us, even about what cosmopolitanism means. Um, so I think this... this uh, so I don't rule out the possibility of a human identity. Actually, I think, given the psychology of human beings, the most likely thing to precipitate a human identity would be the arrival of some aliens. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, because identities, human identities, unfortunately, are often, most often generated in, in yes, in dialogue, but often in conflict. And, um, you know, I, I, nothing would bring us together probably more efficiently than the arrival of some Star Wars-y aliens who were trying to do something to us. Uh, the, the solidarity of Ghanaians was generated by British imperialism. <laughs> when the British arrived, we were busy fighting each other. So, so, um, so and I hope, uh, I, trust me, it won't be worth it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hoping this happens so that we all bind on together. Um, but, and I, but the point is, I think there is the, the, the notion of cosmopolitan, it's already available, the notion of a cosmopolitan identity as something that we, we cosmopolitans can work on together, recognizing that just as woman is a category that uh, women have to work on together and that not all women are going to agree about, uh, but they can still find it useful to discuss. I think that's the way to think about it. And, you know, to make the sort of, the key point for me about, about identities is to the extent that you can to remember that identities divide as well as unite, but that everybody has identities we share. Every two human beings have access to some shared identity. And so uh, when our identities are being used to divide us, we should look for the ones that in the particular context in which the division is occurring can be used to unite us. In the United States, a, 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 resur a resurrected and I think um, less uh, uh, populist uh, patriotism might be a useful resource in trying to bring us together after the divisions that were so badly accentuated uh, in the last few years and, and particularly I think in the last few months. Uh, so, so identities are, are a resource, but we need to recognize all their complications and difficulties and complexities, all the contests that there reasonably are about them. And, and, and therefore, I would say, but this is something that it's easy to say from a position of social privilege, uh, wear them lightly. <laughs> uh, wear them lightly. The important things are truth, justice, equality, uh, kindness, uh, avoiding cruelty, as Judith Sklar always insisted. Um, those are things you shouldn't take lightly. <laughs> those are the things you should take seriously. But man, woman, gay, straight, American, Turkish, they're useful. Don't throw them away. But remember that they can be obstacles as well as tools. And when they're obstacles, remember that you have other tools, including other identities, uh, that you can use to demolish them when they're being obstacles. Well, this leads very naturally into a, a quick closing question. But before I pose that, I'll briefly plug our next event, which is on Friday, February 5th, from 12.15 to 1.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Jeffrey Blum of UMass Boston and Derek Smith of Claremont and McKenna will be discussing the topic very relevant to, today, to today's conversation, oneness and difference in the discourse on race. So we hope you can join us for another stimulating conversation in two weeks time. Um, so to close out this session, it has, to put it mildly, been a very unusual year. <laughs> <laughs> the global pandemic has vividly revealed our deep commonalities biologically, existentially as human beings, our interdependence as a globe, um, but also expose the maladaptive nature of many of our political processes, our identities, our priorities as societies. The killing of George Floyd has uh, exposed the catastrophic injustices that persist in our society, 
the extent to which some human experiences remain unrecognized in our collective narratives and stories. Um, politically, obviously, particularly in this country, questions of democracy, um, the status of various political institutions. A new president was sworn in Wednesday under various uh, very unusual circumstances following the second impeachment of the 45th president. So in light of all these questions, um, and indeed a country and a world that seems to be in tumult, what would be some of the most urgent and important intellectual dilemmas that stand in your own intellectual horizon in the coming months and years? Um, and which of these do you hope to or expect to really wrestle with um, going forward? So Shayla, perhaps you can start by sharing a bit of where your, your current intellectual horizons are headed. Um, I uh, want to go and do more work on the concept of um, popular sovereignty. Uh, I think it is an under-researched concept in political thought. Um, and um, as some of the recent social movements, both on the left and the right, indicate, um, the appeal to po popular sovereignty as a kind of quasi-magical, mythical, uh, mythical dimension. And I want to I want to examine uh, this concept. And of course, I don't know how how much you know uh, U.S. history and of course the development of uh, U.S. conceptions of popular sovereignty, including states' rights, are extremely important. This may be a bit of a departure for me, since my own background is more in European thought, but I'm looking more and more at American um, American discourses around this. And so this is the next, uh, the next uh, big project. And one small project is I have been stunned, truly, by uh, the distrust of science, the distrust of natural science. I mean, in the humanities, we went through the whole uh, sort of deconstruction episode. I'm not using this in the technical sense associated with Derrida. That is not what he meant. But um, a, there was a period where deconstruction was simply identified as rejecting all conceptions of truth and author and text and so on and so forth. So we went through that period. Uh, but somehow natural science was not touched in that discussion, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, what has happened as a result of the COVID crisis is this movement uh, distrusting science and seeing this as a matter of civil liberties and individual rights. I'm uh, completely baffled by this, and uh, it isn't uh, just right-wing militias who object to wearing masks because they believe this is an interference with their civil liberties, but there is also a significant left anarchist movement in Europe that disagrees with government um, shutdowns and people go on demonstrate in Berlin and so on. Um, so this is a smaller project on the side that I'm looking at the interaction between uh, science and politics and what what has changed and and why. Um, so I think. Um, I have, uh, it's difficult for me to figure out how to intervene in some of the biggest challenges we face because I think philosophers are good at arguing with people who have arguments and who are <laughs> organizing ideas and making propositions and, and so on. And a lot of what's going on isn't really to be met uh, it, there may be a role for patiently insisting on 
the truth and pointing out that something is a is a, is a logical error and so on. But but we've been doing that and it hasn't had much impact. So I don't know how to intervene in some of these things in a, in the in the way that philosophers can intervene. I, I feel there's this is there's a, maybe more to be done by sort of social psychologists and people to figure out what's going on here and then to see if we can uh, solve the. What well, I think what's going on is a kind of social uh, social social psychological disorder uh, uh, that's connected with um, the rise of a very large subpopulation of the United States in the tens of millions who have bizarrely um, out of touch beliefs about about reality, about everything from climate change to uh, uh, to the election. And uh, I think one thing that philosophers can, can and social sociologists' knowledge can contribute to is thinking about the processes that produce these pockets of systematically organized uh, counter knowledge, counter uh, ignorance. Uh, the, the systematic production of ignorance is a, is a is a is a epistemological question. I think which should be studied. Um, I don't know that I'm particularly well placed to it, but I, I at the Last week at the American Philosophical Association, I was urging philosophers to think about this. Um, what I'm actually working on myself mostly at the moment is um, I'm finishing a book about religion, which is a sort of part of my identity work. But I, what, I, what I'm turning to and, and thinking about is something that's part of what's going on in the present and part of the challenges at the moment, which is uh, work. The, uh, the, there's a question in social ontology, what is work? is labor and this is uh, Hannah Arendt wrote about these questions um, uh, but but lots of people um, write about them now um, there's a question of social ontology then what is work and do we need uh, is it a useful concept uh, the modern concept of work was produced through the industrial revolution well that was a particular stage in the development of the world economy maybe we've reached a stage where work isn't the right concept to organize the things that it organizes which include uh, wages and the distribution of uh, of money uh, mm -hmm. uh, the regulation of large areas of our life uh, uh, many people as, as uh, elizabeth anderson's been pointing out recently many people live their lives in places where they're regulated by people who have almost carte blanche to do to abuse them to fire them for expressing views that the boss doesn't like uh, and so on uh, that, that's legal in the United States because we have at will uh, employment laws in almost every state there's one exception I forget what it is it's somewhere surprising like Utah or, or North Dakota um, so uh, so there's a question whether work is actually the right concept for thinking about the the, the complex questions of production distribution uh, equality and so on that that are in fact in our world organized through the concept. Um, then there are these. There are obviously political questions, uh, political philosophy questions about what we should do, especially if we abandon the work concept, um, which which means thinking about uh, universal basic incomes and things like that, uh, which I think may be part of the solution to the sense of alienation that large numbers of people in the in the post-industrial world have. Um, one of the features of the inequality that Shaila was talking about earlier, is that we've had a kind of hollowing out of the middle so that more and more people are in the precariat, more and more in the, in the, in the post-industrial world. There are all these people. We know them because some of them are our graduate students, right, who are living, <laughs> I mean, literally, they're living, they're living on incomes that are, mean that they're entitled to uh, welfare support. And yet they're working, they're teaching courses at two thousand dollars a pop or something uh so they're teaching eight of them and they're driving around on the freeway from one campus to another so there's lots of uh th that going on lots of uh, people who are being turned into precariat i think um gig the gig economy uh takes away from people uh the capacity to um to fight back against bad employment practices, which you have in, in a workplace which can be unionized. You can't unionize uh, Uber drivers. They don't, they've never met each other. So there are lots of questions, I think, which are relevant to the social crisis, but are also, like all philosophical questions, things that philosophers can get interested in just because we find them interesting. But I, I, do, I do think of this as in part a response to, the, to some of the problems of the crisis. I would say one other thing that I have been thinking about, and my way of 
thinking about this has mostly been to write about it in my other sis column, which is the deep confusions people seem to have about what the what you're being asked to do when you're being asked to wear a mask. They seem to think that this is a mm. paternalist measure, but it's not a paternalist measure. You're being asked to do something that will protect other people. It's 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 exactly the sort of thing that states even states which are highly rights respecting ask people to do we've had we've had uh, laws about uh, uh, quarantine in in liberal societies all along and we should have and they do not violate uh, they can be used in ways that violate rights as any law can be but they can also be used in ways that are perfectly consistent with the reasonable rights of other people and i think it's astonishing to me that it's been we've been able to turn this measure which is a public health measure it's not a paternalist measure aimed at the good of the of the mask wearer it's aimed at the good of society as a whole and if we all wear masks we can contribute to a great good and it seems astonishing to me that it's been possible to persuade people that there's something terrible about being asked to contribute together to a great good. Well, I'm so sorry I have to put it. I, it under normal circumstances, I would invite you to another room where we would enjoy refreshments <laughs> and continue the conversation, maskless. Um, but sadly, I cannot do that. Um, what I can do, yes, exactly. We can do this. And I can say that we eagerly look forward to, to all these ongoing works you've been discussing uh, Shayla Ben Habib, Kwame Anthony Apia, thank you so much for your time. It's been such a rich discussion. And of course, thanks to all of you who have tuned in. We really do hope to see you again next time. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you. very much. Thank you.